Now to the panel, Labor MP Joel Fitzgibbon and commercial litigator, businesswoman and columnist Carolyn De Russo. To both of you, welcome. Hi, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Good to have you with us. I want to start with you, Joel, if I may. The government admitted that their IR laws were not major reforms, but I've got to say the backlash would suggest that they might as well be. The unions have brought back the word work choices and you can see the rash developing on the skins of all those coalition MPs, Joel. Well, we are the Labor Party, Chris, and we were born uh, to represent working people and, in particular, those with disproportionate or lack of power uh, who are fighting for a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. So you'd expect the Labor Party to be very defensive. Uh, the government claims there is no harm being done here. Well, we'll test this legislation or this bill, and, of course, it will go before a, a Senate committee uh, and all of these propositions will be thoroughly tested by our senators. But there's one golden rule uh, here for us, and that is that while we are very open to measures that put more flexibility in the economy and which allow the, con the economy to grow more strongly, uh, we won't allow that to happen at the expense uh, of the working conditions of the people who we strive to represent. I get all of that, but don't you think it makes sense that as we crawl and struggle to get ourselves uh, away from the cliff and get things moving again. S we need a Philip. We need something to incentivise... I hate using that word, but I just did. Incentivise employers to create more jobs? Well, I'm a former small business operator myself, Chris. I understand this concept uh, very, very well. And, again, we are open to flexibility. Of course, we are. I mean, we gave birth to flexibility... Uh, under Keating's reforms, uh, the birth of enterprise bargaining, getting mm. away from the rigid structures of the award system uh, only. But we, we, we also know the form of the Liberal and National parties a la work choices and what they attempted to do uh, all those years ago. So you, you can't blame us, and nor do I think would your viewers blame us, uh, for being sceptical and being very cautious and careful and being determined to ensure that uh, workers who have done so well throughout the course of COVID-19 uh, aren't left behind as a result of this bill. Carolyn, I won't go through the detail with you of what they're proposing. We had some leak earlier on in the week and then an announcement yesterday and then uh, other aspects of it um, tabled today. But I, I don't see where this is going. The last time that party decided to run a reform in workplaces, they got rumbled and Kevin Rudd became the Prime Minister. He did, and the, the fact of the matter is that occurred, you know, that was a very long time ago now, but it's still, those wounds are still fresh, aren't they? Mm. Um, look, the, the thing is, um, we, we've come through a period of quite serious um, business disruption. Um, I have uh, no issue with the notion of flexibility. I, similarly, I don't want, I don't want to see um, workers' rights run all over. Um, but, you know, my understanding of this bill and the, the necessary um, agreement between the employer and the employee and then going and getting your blessing from fair work, you know, it, it's not just the employer working, walking onto the factory floor and saying, look, sorry, you're all on gruel for the next two years because I need to go buy the new rangey. <laughs> you know, we, we, we have had the, the temporary insolvency measures in um, since March. Yep. Those are going to come to an end at the end of the year, then we're going to see JobKeeper come to an end. So we are going to see um, some insolvencies come in. We have had significantly less insolvencies this year than in any given year. So you are going to see you're going to see that tranche. You're going to see that tranche of COVID-related insolvencies. But there is going to be some marginal businesses there. There's going to be some borderline businesses there who might be able to make it through if everyone just works together a little bit and takes, you know, a little bit of a haircut or a little bit of... Um, of, you know, just, just moving away from, from your ordinary position, you know, um, working more flexibly, more agilely, and that might be enough to just make sure, you know, enough comes through at the top here so that, you know, the expenses can get paid at the other end. Because I understand the issue with regards to wage cuts and I understand the issue with regards to job security, but if a company goes into liquidation, you get neither. You get none. That's exactly right. OK, to your backyard, Joel. Mining giant Glencore has unveiled plans to shut two of its Hunter Valley coal mines in 2023. 
in what it describes as a Paris Agreement aligned strategy. But tell me, am I wrong here? I get the impression they still want to sell coal, though. Oh, they sure do, Chris. This created a big headline in the Hunter Valley today, but it's all about nothing. Uh, we've known that uh, two mines, the Dell and um, Integra, uh, were always going to close in or around 2023. Uh, the union has known that for a long time. The last time they did an enterprise agreement there, it was on the basis it would be the last. But at the same time, I mean, these, these two coal mines have just run out of coal. Uh, but at the, at the same time, um, the same company has applications into the New South Wales government to extend uh, two other existing mines for around a 20-year period. Hang on, hang and on. And they're expanding elsewhere in the they're Hunter Valley. They're trying to save the planet, aren't they? I thought Glencore were trying to save the planet. Yeah, uh, look, I think, I think Glencore got caught out a bit here. They were saying trying to say one thing to uh, the European investors, um, trying to make out that the closure of these mines was part of their plan to reduce their carbon emissions, but forgot to tell them <laughs> that at the same time they're expanding a number of mines in the same region. Oh, dear. Now, Carolyn, the Nine Network has reportedly axed the publication of a paid monthly insert in its newspapers which promoted the Chinese Communist Party. Nine's political editor Chris Yulman tweeted, better late than never is a generous way of describing this. This was all wrong from the very beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it probably um, it probably was, but at the same time, I think there was a little less heat than what there is now. Um, I think this has become a broader issue, particularly um, as China, you know, ratchets up um, its uh, its um, its verbiage and its attack on on Australian exports. I think the issue has become broader in the community, and I think accepting um, adverts like this becomes harder. Um, harder to defend, and, and th there becomes a level of corporate risk for Nine in in in, in taking um, in taking those advertisements. You know that being said, I, I'm generally pretty libertarian about these sorts of things. Pretty freedom of speech, and you know I I, I don't love the idea of censorship and I don't know if I necessarily want to call it censorship but I, but I can appreciate how in this circumstance um, it, it does get to the point where promoting the the Communist Party of China um, it gets pretty close to the line and, and I think that that nine have had to make a, a corporate decision here uh, because I think it's getting to the point that the Australian community doesn't consider it acceptable. Joel let me entertain another option could it be that nine got a tap on the shoulder about that insert? by government? I just don't know, Chris. I mean, I've never seen this insert or noticed it, so I don't exactly know uh, what it says. But it's interesting, given we were just talking about freedom of speech, freedom uh, of expression. Can I just quickly say, I, I got into a stoush with the Vice-Chancellor of the University of New South Wales earlier this year, public stoush. We were exchanging barbs in the nine newspapers, uh, maybe, um, about their decision to divest themselves of any... Uh, interest in fossil fuels. Now, this is the university which has the one of the greatest mining schools of any university in our country. I went onto their website and there's this coloured pho photo of a big dump truck in an open-cut mine designed to attract mining students, and yet they're divesting themselves <laughs> of any interest in fossil fuels. It's just, uh, it's just extraordinary. Like Glencore, they're getting splinters sitting on the fence like that. Joel Fitzgibbon, <laughs> Carolyn DeRusso, thank you both for being on the program.